So we'll go ahead and get started today with our second episode of the Botany Bistro. Uh, today we're going to be highlighting some of the historical botanists that have come before and getting a little bit of a sneak peek at some of the future botanical endeavors that we will be exploring next week. So um, last week, if you didn't join us, we do have an archive of all of our bistro videos, what we'll be putting together. And so you're more than welcome to keep up with that. Um, we talked last week about some basics for botany, and we enjoyed a little seasonal strawberry salad with some spinach. Um, so today we're going to be continuing that conversation and learning about some of the history of botany. So for today, um, lunch, our menu today, uh, includes a side of peas, and I sauteed up some onions and some garlic in here. Uh, gave it a little seasoning with some mustard, put that all together, a little white wine, um, and it's really come together nicely. So we'll be talking about a few of these ingredients today, and then we'll be able to have time at the end for questions um, and just from sharing. So I'll let you turn on your microphones and your videos at the end of the lecture today. Um, but we'll start out uh, just talking a little bit about the history of botany and um, then I'm going to give you a little bit of homework <laughs> just like last week. Uh, last week's homework was to observe a leaf for one full minute and so hopefully some of you were able to do that and appreciate the complexities in something that we often uh, take for granted as very simple and it's not always so simple. Let me introduce myself to those of you who don't know me. My name is Mary Dudley and I am the Ecology Education Manager at the Civic Garden Center, which is where we are hosting Botany Bistro every other Friday. Uh, so glad that you could join us today. Botany Bistro will be free for anyone who wants to join in. And like I said, we will be archiving all of the videos. So if you can't join for any particular session, just know that you can catch up at any time. Uh, we really want to share this information for people to be able to use in their own gardening lives um, and just to empower our community to be able to understand the fundamentals about plants so that they can explore new ways that we can engage with them through urban agriculture and making sure that we are conserving our natural spaces. So the Civic Garden Center is located in Avondale, which is a neighborhood of Cincinnati, Ohio. We've been here since 1942, celebrating 80 years, going strong. We were started through the Victory Garden Movement and since then have continued our passion for education urban agriculture and conservation in many different ways. And so there's lots of opportunities to get involved here at the Civic Garden Center if you've never come to see us. So be sure to come visit sometime. I have a love of plants, a love of nature that I've had since I was very young. I graduated from Miami University in Oxford, Ohio with an advanced degree in botany and just can't get enough of these amazing organisms, uh, seeing how they grow and change and seeing the different variations between species is very exciting. Um, so I'm always down for a plant walk. I really enjoy traveling to seeing new ecosystems. Uh, and so Ohio has always been a place I call home because of the beautiful flora that we have. Um, but there are many other parts of the country that are just bursting with new things to find. And some of the botanists where you will talk about today um, have really dug deep into local communities, and some others have decided to travel the world and look at some exotics. So we'll get started on that. All right. Just uh, as a hint, too, if Google Meet is new for you, in order to make sure that the presentation is nice and clear, you can pin use that little thumbtack icon uh, when you hover over my face and that will make it larger so that you can see the presentation um, and so you can move around some things on your screen to make sure that you can see. I will not have a presenting time for a separate PowerPoint and so if you're 
wanting to listen to this on a walk or in the car, um, that's wonderful too. So we really wanted to make sure that these sessions could be used in different ways. So thank you for that. And any feedback that you have is greatly appreciated. Um, we can take that at the end, or you can send us an email at civicgardencenter.org. All right. Well, let's dig into it. Let's dig into botany and the history of botany um, and what is this world all about and why, you know, am I eating peas and onions and garlic today? So we'll figure out the mystery um, of our meal. So the first person to kind of call themselves a botanist, according to the records that we have, um, was a student of Aristotle. Theophrastus, um, and he lived from 30, 371 to 286 BC. Um, and most of the work at that time was very concerned with uh, really cataloging the medicinal plants that were being used. Um, all of the medicines that were being used were plant-based. And so there was a real need for understanding how those different plants grew and uh, there was trade going on, and so they wanted to make sure that they were getting the right plants for the right purpose. And so the cataloging of plants for medical purposes was really a driving force for botany and still is a large part of the botanical world, making sure that we really have <laughs> identified correctly what that plant is. Um, you want to make sure that that medicine is very clean. So that was the way that that started out. Um, you know, we have a strong history of agriculture in this region um, and around the world. So uh, they think that crops were starting to be domesticated about 12,000 years ago. And so I'd have to say that even though we have, you know, Aristotle's student uh, claiming that botanical name, that the first agriculturalists um, really were true botanists as well, really figuring out what is this plant life cycle, um, you know, I harvest plants from these wooded areas and they look a little bit different than when I see them in different areas. And just thinking about the life cycle of how they could actually carry these plants with them so that they wouldn't have to continue searching for them. And so they could start to make crops and we could have permanent settlements. Um, I once had a college student that I was teaching uh, in a basic class and he came to my office hours and he was like you know why is what's up with botany why is it so important anyway and i'm like it's the cornerstone of human civilization uh, we would still be wandering if we hadn't figured out how to domesticate and grow crops um, the corn ancestry uh, of what we grow in the fields today is very different from what they were gathering um, from the natural areas around them many, many thousands of years ago. And so we've had just an aptitude, an inkling, I think, in our general um, world to be able to look and find details about plants. We just have a hunger for it. Um, and so I think that that's something that is a legacy that has continued very strongly. Uh, so we are going to talk a little bit more about agriculture and breeding, things like that, in some future series. Uh, so definitely stay tuned for that. We're not going to talk a lot more right now about that particular point in history because we are going to move on now um, to Carl Linnaeus, who is a name that probably some of you know, uh, often considered the father of taxonomy. And so a big part of being able to organize these plant species was in naming. And because we have many beautiful languages in this globe, um, you know, that was a challenge because uh, we have lots of common names for things. We have um, people that live in different regions, have slightly different plant species that they're um, using. And so it was really a big challenge um, to be able to learn how to organize these species. And so none of the botanists I talk about today worked in a vacuum. I want to make that very clear that there are uh, players behind the scenes that didn't make it into the history books. Um, and so I'm sure that there were a whole whole teams of people uh, that should, we should be honoring in our chat today. Um, but I'll be picking out just a few um, for us to look at. But if this is something that intrigues you, uh, there is lots of research you can do about the history of botany. 
But we'll talk about Linnaeus. Uh, this might be a little bit of a biology <laughs> class review for you. Um, and so he was very clear on the fact that we needed to have this binomial nomenclature system. So big words there. But um, basically it took species and it organized them into several different categories, starting with kingdom. And then you have phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. So the most detailed, most specific, unique identifier is the species, and the genus is a group that that species fits within. And so if you went backwards, you know, the, the most specific species, then genus, and then you get to your family, order, class, phylum, kingdom. Uh, and there are different acronyms we probably all used in high school to try to remember that for the test. <laughs> But uh, that was something that he took research that had been done at the time and then said, you know what, let's start naming these species with genus and specific epithet is what that's called. And so when you see a botanical name, you'll often see a common name. And then in parentheses or in italics, or maybe both, um, you'll see the binomial nomenclature name. And typically those are uh, have kind of a Latin base to them, and so you can figure out what some of those base words, some of those roots mean when you're talking about the plants. Um, and then some of them are named after people. So uh, it's a pretty interesting naming system that was widely adopted by many of the explorers and naturalists uh, at the time. And so we've kept that uh, since then, and so we still use binomial nomenclature now. So that was the work of Carl Linnaeus. Uh, he was Swedish, and he also um, published a book called the Genera Plantarum in 1737, which meant that he became this global authority on plants. And so when other uh, scientists and researchers were trying to identify their plants, they would send samples. Um, and these were actual samples. You know, you're not taking a photograph and emailing it. <laughs> They're like taking actual uh, species from work sites from farms, from natural areas, uh, putting that together and sending it in a large package and saying, okay, Carl, can you help identify what this is? And if it was a new species, of course, that was very exciting. Um, and they would want to be able to name it. But really, that was a big, big job, too, to be able to say, oh, no, this is the same species that someone found could be in a different country, but it's already been named and cataloged. Um, so really taking all of that knowledge and piecing it together in a purposeful way was something that we got from Carl Linnaeus. Uh, the next botanist we're going to talk about uh, is Gregor Mendel. And if you've heard of Mendelian inheritance, when I learned it, it was Mendelian genetics. Um, but since Gregor didn't have any uh, training or, or they didn't have any knowledge at the time about DNA, uh, they call it inheritance. And so that's surprise why I'm eating peas today. It goes along with our uh, chat about Gregor Mendel. And so Gregor Mendel was born in the Czech Republic and became a priest. And so he was in a monastery doing lots of work, also doing lots of teaching. And over the course of a couple of years, 1854 to 1856, he was really working hard on trying to figure out why certain traits were expressed and why certain traits were not. He chose to do this with pea plants. Um, and so he chose this because if you look very carefully at a bag of pea seeds, you know, the next time you're just randomly looking at pea seeds, um, you can notice some genetic variations, some differences. And so there are some that are more yellow. There are some that are more green. There are some that are a little bit wrinkled. There are some that are not. Uh, and so he's, oh, okay, I see all these differences in these seeds. Why is that? And then when you grow out a pea plant, it will often have blooms that could be slightly different from other varieties. So you can have pink flowers, you can have white flowers, you can have a light purple flower. Uh, and how does all that affect one another? So he was very concerned about figuring out the details on this because he had worked under the tutelage of other people that were very interested in the physics and the chemistry of 
plant breeding. Um, and so this was actually interesting because Gregor Mendel was not famous in his time. His work was rediscovered about 50 years later. Um, it had been distributed in some small circles. But we now teach this lesson to students constantly. And if you think about some of the ways that we discuss genetics, it really was the basis for what he was doing. And he was able to figure this out with very limited uh, tools, um, but with a lot of intelligence behind it. And so he took pea plants and he would cross-pollinate them. And so he had to know about the pea life cycle. He had to figure out that this parent had red flowers and this parent had white flowers. And when I cross them together, they're not all pink. And so the existing thought at the time was that characteristics and traits blend together so that two parents would just have a blend. Whereas now we know that some of our traits and characteristics are dictated by dominant and recessive alleles, genes. And so that all that knowledge came forth from Gregor Mendel uh, and doing experiments on peas. And so you can think about, they have the four square, it looks kind of like a window pane, and you'll have your dominant recessive, your dominant dominant, your recessive recessive. And so it happened at this um, ratio that he was noticing lots of patterns. And so he was putting that together. Um, and I like the fact that he continued to do his research even though it was not a popular idea at the time. And maybe that was some of the driving force in him not heavily publishing. Um, but it's very neat to think about every time we eat a pea that the genetic properties of those plants uh, really built up a lot of the first stages of botany. Uh, another wonderful uh, contributor to botany is George Washington Carver, who uh, kind of came out to be a botanist in a different way. So uh, he was attending school at Simpson College and, um, in 1888, and he was drawing lots of pictures of plants. And the detail that he was putting into these beautiful pieces of art was attracting some attention from his professors. And so he was encouraged to go to uh, Iowa State University and study agriculture and study plants and botany. And so George Washington Carver, we, all, we might have heard about him in school. Um, he did a lot of things with peanuts and peanut production. Uh, he did not invent peanut butter. That was uh, invented thousands of years prior. Uh, but he really came up with this idea of crop rotation. And so thinking about how growing the same plants in the same soil over and over depletes that soil of any kind of nutrient bank. And so how can we revitalize our soils? And so he encouraged farmers in the South to plant peas because peas are a legume, um, or sorry, peanuts. <laughs> to plant peanuts. I'm on peas and they're also legumes. But um, to plant peanuts down south and it would help build that soil structure and help retain some of the nutrients that they needed for other crops that they wanted to plant. Uh, the only issue that came about around this time was that there was not really a market for peanut products in the volume that was now being produced. So these farmers were like, oh yeah, definitely, I can tell that my soils are better and that I need to rotate my crops. Uh, what am I going to do with all these peanuts? <laughs> so um, George Washington Carver was very ingenious, very intelligent, and came up with lots of products that peanut oil and peanuts could be used for so that the farmers would continue to rotate their crops. Um, so very interesting idea. I hadn't really put those two things together until I had started researching for this class. Um, and he's also just been instrumental in talking about different ways that farmers can look at their ecosystem. So um, George Washington Carver, it's a good read. The next one we're going to discuss is David Fairchild. Um, David Fairchild was working for the USDA, which stands for the United States Department of Agriculture in the 1890s, um, and he was an explorer. And I worked at Fairchild Tropical Botanic Garden in Coral Gables, Florida for um, almost four years. 
And, you know, I hadn't heard of him before I had moved down there. And I was like, oh, you know, what's going on with this guy? And then I keep hearing his name pop up. And so um, David Fairchild was born in East Lansing, Michigan, but lived in um, other states as well. And he just, he didn't necessarily come from a farming background, but he started to look at different types of plants and think about how we could diversify some of what we were growing here in the United States. So he uh, took many trips around the world, um, lots to the tropics, which was why he wanted to start the Botanic Garden so he could bring back some of his uh, finds, but is responsible for bringing back over 200,000 species from outside of the country. Um, and it was fruits, vegetables, grains, um, and thinking about how they could work those in. So anytime you enjoy an avocado, uh, if you have a beer made from local hops, um, if you enjoy kale or quinoa, those are all species that he brought back from his travels. Um, now I will say that in our current state, uh, we are very cautious about invasive species um, and introducing species that are not adapted for this space. Um, and also thinking about how our ecosystems flourish with native um, plants. So I will say that it was a different time in the 1890s, um, and the introduction of these exotic species was very exciting and also not very well regulated. Um, and so, you know, you couldn't do that now. It'd be very difficult to do that now. Uh, but what we weren't able to do is what we can do now. We weren't able to transport a lot of these um, fruits when they were per, when they were mature and uh, ripe because we didn't have a lot of the air travel and the refrigeration that we have now. So it all kind of fits within that lens. Um, but David Fairchild also worked with a woman named Eliza Skidmore to get the cherry blossoms to DC. So if you've ever enjoyed the cherry blossoms, um, that was actually kind of a, a challenge, uh, more of a challenge than was expected. Uh, the first crop of trees that were sent uh, over from Japan as a gift were very large, you know, mature trees. Um, very excited to have them come and bloom in our nation's capital. However, there was some fungus found on those plants, and so um, they were ordered to be destroyed so that they didn't contaminate any of the plants that we had here. Uh, and thankfully, the relationship wasn't soured. The second batch was sent over and they were smaller this time and they were able to uh, be a little bit more compacted and, you know, just made sure that this, what they were sending was very clean. Um, and so now we have these beautiful cherry blossoms in our capital. Um, so it's a neat story that David Fairchild and Eliza Skidmore uh, made come to fruition. Uh, so now I'm going to kind of move a little bit closer to home. Uh, we have some amazing botanical history here in our region, in greater Cincinnati, and um, one of the most powerful stories is from Lucy Brown. And for a while I thought it was pronounced Braun, but I recently saw A Force of Nature, which is a documentary about the Brown sisters. And they were born and raised here in Cincinnati. Um, Lucy was the third woman to earn a PhD from University of Cincinnati in 1914. Her sister Annette was the first woman to earn her PhD from UC in 1911. And she just, she traveled, she hiked, <laughs> she documented, she observed. Her and her sister uh, really are responsible for understanding the succession that happens in this area after an area might have been farmed or was pasture and then as it is let to go towards more of a forested ecosystem her and her sister were able to document those her sister was Annette was very interested in um, little critters little insects um, and so I think that they made a really great pair while Lucy was out on her hikes she would be collecting the plants and noting changes in that forest structure system, um, and her sister was out collecting bugs, so I think that would be really fun. Um, in 1950, she published The Deciduous Forest of Eastern North America, 
um, which was just very, very detailed on hyper-local species. And the result of that has been to protect the area that she worked in. It's called the Lynx Prairie. And so if you'd like to go see the area she was working in, you can definitely go see. Um, and there are currently 20,000 acres protected in that area. Uh, and she also was part of a growing movement to protect more natural spaces in our country. And so the Nature Conservancy uh, was a big part of that. She was a big advocate. So um, it was just starting when she was in her early career, and then she worked with them on and off. And had, now the Nature Conservancy has protected over 190 million acres. <laughs> so it's really exciting. Um, to have her history be based here in Cincinnati um, and yet have such a global reach. And so that was very important. So thank you to the Brown Sisters very much. If you'd like to know more about what uh, the Brown Sisters did, there's a very nice presentation um, exhibit for them at the Cincinnati Museum Center. And so they also house in their library lots of her original documentation. So you can go there and check it out. Um, the last uh, botanist we're going to talk about today is also local. Her name is Dr. Valerie Pence, and she works at the Crew Center at the Cincinnati Zoo. And so Crew stands for the Center for Conservation and Research of Endangered Wildlife. Um, she has been the director there for many years. And Dr. Pence is working on how to propagate species in vitro, which means in glass, and so using very small amounts of tissue to actually propagate entire plants. And so I won't go into a ton of detail right now on her work because I am gonna have another session on biotechnology uh, later, but the basicness of it is so, it, it, it's wonderful to be able to take not a whole plant when you're studying endangered species, right? You don't want to remove possibly, you know, the only individual, um, but you can take a few cells on a leaf and from there you can preserve those cells and then she does research on figuring out what is the best growing medium, how do you propagate this um, so that we don't lose that heritage, that botanical heritage of our world, um, really protecting that. And so I think that that research is just so exciting and it's just happening right uh, out our back door. So um, she is also on the board of the Lloyd Library Museum and has published over 188 scientific papers um, and book chapters. Now when I say in vitro, that is juxtaposed by in vivo, which would be in the ground. Um, and so it's a, it's a very different type of gardening. A lot of orchids are propagated in that way. Um, but yeah, if you go to their center, you'll see lots of little glass test tubes all lined up. Um, some of them growing things, some of them uh, just starting to get their little pieces put in. So very exciting work over there. So that is a roundup of our um, botanists. And so uh, just to review, we talked about Theophrastus, um, who was a student of Aristotle. Uh, we mentioned Carl Linnaeus, and then we talked about Gregor Mendel, George Washington Carver, David Fairchild, Lucy Brown, and Valerie Pence. Um, and so those were the folks that we highlighted today. Now, there are a couple of other botanical things I wanted to talk about uh, as our lunch goes. And so um, I have a couple of things in my lunch bowl today that um, we can discuss. So we already talked about the peas and how important peas are because of all the studies that Gregor Mendel did. Um, but I also have onion and garlic in here. And I wanted to mention those because they are a type of plant that produces a modified stem, and that modified stem is grown into a bulb. Um, now there are other plants that also do this uh, in different ways, and some of them are modified roots, and some of them are modified stems, so you really kind of have to sort through what you're doing. But for the 
onion and the garlic that I'm using today. They are modified stems. And I think that that's really interesting because if you think about these bulbs that grow under the ground um, and how they are storage units for different starches and uh, energy sinks so that the plant will have those in times of need. Um, I think about another bulb and that is tulips. And so I don't know if I have any tulip uh, lovers in the audience today, but um, I wanted to mention tulip mania. So this was something, uh, this is just a fun botanical history story, but uh, in Holland, the Dutch economy um, was very uh, fluid and lots of trading, you know, so they had um, lots of influxes of different products coming through, coming, coming and going. Um, and one of these happened to be tulip bulbs. And so there was a fascination with different types of tulip bulbs. And, um, you know, we all kind of, I think, in our minds can imagine the typical tulip. Um, but if they had the petals multicolored or if they were feathered, uh, then that was a very big deal. And so people started to want these tulips, prized tulips. People were paying, in our today's prices, exorbitant amounts. Um, you know, the price of a brand new car and the price of a house uh, just for singular bulbs. Um, now this bubble did pop, <laughs> like most bubbles do, and um, what they found actually was that the plants that were being very sought after, the tulips, uh, actually there was a virus uh, mutation that was happening within that plant to kind of have those multicolored petals and the feathering, um, and it just wasn't sustainable. It made them very sickly, and so you couldn't guarantee that you were going to be able to gather seeds from that and continue to propagate it. And so um, as they kind of started to focus on these species that were not very fertile, um, that whole uh, idea kind of crashed. So uh, it, I, in my research for this session, it doesn't seem to be as big of a deal maybe as the botanists that I hang out with talked about it. You know, like it wasn't necessarily an Easter Island situation, um, but tulip mania was still a pretty interesting part of our history and anytime people you know go gaga for plants i'm here for it <laughs> that was pretty funny um so i do have some homework for you today and the homework that you have today is to um take some seeds from your pantry and test them for germination and so um doesn't require a lot of specialized equipment um I have a paper towel and I am going to get that paper towel a little bit damp. And so I just have a little cup of water here and get this a little bit damp. And I'm going to open up my paper towel and I am going to create a germination chamber with my paper towel. So I found some lima beans left over from a soup that I did not make. And so I want to see if they'll germinate. Now they're a little bit old and they've just kind of been sitting there. Um, but in the process of learning more about botany and science, I'm going to germinate them. So I'm going to put 10 of these seeds just so I can easily do my germination rate math. Um, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 into my wet paper towel. And so I've got them all here. There you go. And then I'm going to fold them over. And you could put this into a Ziploc bag that is just open barely at the corner because you don't want it to rot in there. Um, or you can just leave it like this. And so I'm just going to leave my damp paper towel in a cool, dark place. Um, I think I'll set it in one of my cabinets um, where I keep my cups at home. And I'm going to check on it in a day or two. And I'm going to open it up and I'm going to see if there are any roots. And so I encourage you to do that with just something you have around. Don't go buy seeds for this. Um, if you're eating an apple and you want to see if you can germinate those apple seeds, if um, you're enjoying a grapefruit um, or an orange, something like that, there are seeds all around us. And so starting to understand the processes of botany and uh, just kind of getting into the nitty gritty of what we're going to be talking about, especially in our future sessions.